Arthur Henry Ransom McCumbie and my father, Fred Cole McCumbie. This is Sunday afternoon, September 5th, 1982. We're going to talk about our family history. Granddaddy, will you tell me your father's name and tell me just some of his history? Joseph McCumbie. Well, I haven't I got much to say about my daddy because he left me when I was a little boy. I think I was about seven years old. And I don't know much of his past life. He was a good daddy as long as he lived with us. But he left us about 1904. And we have never heard from him, only some news that come once that somebody seen him in Florida. I don't know what part of Florida it was in, but it was in Florida somewhere. A fellow Bright that went off with him, come back home probably a couple of years after that, and said my daddy was still in Florida, and he had married the second time. He had married a, another, a woman out in Florida. And so that's about the last that I ever heard of my daddy. How, how, many, how many were they, daddy? How, how many of the children were they? There was five of us. What were their uh, names? My sister's name was Corny. Was she and, the oldest? And that, that was, she was the oldest, and I was next. And my next, one next to me was named Gussie. And then there was one named Ruth. And then I had a brother, a little brother, named Homer. That was by my daddy's side. He was about two years old when my daddy left. Uncle he, Homer was. Uncle Homer was about two years old, he, I remember. And standing him down on the porch when he left. He left the little fellow standing on the porch I walked about 50 yards to a little building, a little house, and got in it. I was ashamed of people to see me cry, and I got in there. And I reckon I told him a story, because he told me when he went to leave at the gig to be a good boy till he seen me again. So I've never seen him anymore, and I've not been a good boy. I've made several mistakes in life. But I'm still able to thank the Lord for the blessings he had given me. And how old were you, Granddaddy, when he I, left? I was about seven years old. I had been to school one time for about two weeks. And that was in August before we had the second school, and probably in September it started then. October, maybe, I don't know, school. Then it wasn't like it is now. There. You went a few months and that was it. So if the teacher had something to do at home, he stayed at home and worked, and you could stay at home and play if you wanted to. It was all right with them and all right with the committee. Nobody said anything about school much. It was just a, a thing. If you could go, you could go, and if you couldn't go, you, you didn't go. Daddy, where did you go to school at? Was the, the first school I ever went to, I went to Flood and Plain mm -hmm. to a, a school. And my teacher's name was Mac Durney. And uh, he had me one time to, I was sleepy. And uh, he asked me, he called to me and asked me whether I was sleepy. And I told him, yes, sir. And he said, come up there. And I got up there to him and he told me to lay down on the floor. And a lady, a young lady by the name of Jenny Lewis, she uh, forbid it. She said, Dude, that young one will not lay down on that floor. She said, buddy, she said, you come over here to me. And I went over there and sat by her. And she learned me my ABCs at school. Well, did you go, when did you go to this Black Creek School? Didn't you go to Black Creek School down here? I went to Black Creek School a little while. Mm -hmm. Is that where? I don't know. That was sometime 
early in 1989 or something like that. Where did you first meet uh, my mother, Nancy Jane Norris? Uh, I met her at Black Creek School. She was a little girl, and I was a little boy, and we met at Black Creek School. And we played together some, not much. Boys and girls didn't play together too much, but I played with her some. And uh, I went just a little while, and we had a, <coughs> a big race, me and the boys. And we were playing foxes and dogs. And uh, of course, naturally, I was a fox. I was always the one that was after. And uh, I lost my book. Somewhere down in that bay, it was thick. So Mama, she, was, she wasn't able to buy me another book. So I didn't go to school anymore. I probably went to Black Creek maybe, maybe 30 days. In school days, 30 school days, maybe. Not to me that. Not I wouldn't be too sure of it, but something like that. And I lost my book, and I couldn't go anymore. Daddy, now who was who was your daddy's uh, daddy? Who was your granddaddy? What my was granddaddy, name? my granddaddy on my daddy's side was named uh, Henry Henry McCombe. I was named after. Did he have a middle name? No, not as I've ever heard of. Uh, Did you know him? Do you remember seeing him? No, sir. I remember seeing my great granddaddy. That was he, that was Henry's daddy. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And he was said to be a uh, Indian. I don't know. He was a tall man. What was I, his name? I don't know what his name was. I, I never did see him. But one time I was in the road at a place of playing with a little wagon, and he come along. And he asked me, was Ellen at home? That was my mama. And I told him, yes, sir. And I went with him, and I, I walked alongside of him and looked up at him. He was a tall man. He was, I believe he was more than six foot, probably six foot and three or four inches. Might have been six inches, I don't know. But he was a tall man. And he had a little pipe. And that little pipe had a, a reed stem to it, and he held it in his hand the most of the time, the little pipe. And he walked straight. He didn't. He, he put his feet right straight ahead of one another. She seemed like he walked funny to me. But anyway, we went on up to the house. I went with him, and uh, so he sat down in his chair and on the porch. And Mama, she done the talking. He didn't do much asking questions or much talking much. Of course, it didn't last that long before I got out to pay my wagon again. I had it, and I just bought it. I bought it from a boy. I gave him a, a copper cent, a penny. Somebody give me, I don't know who gave him the penny. And I, I give him that penny and a railroad spike and a little knife chain, a little chain that you could buy him for a nickel, they said. And I got the chain from somebody. And I gave him that chain and that railroad spike and that penny for that little wagon. And I just got the wagon and I was Pretty quick I left granddaddy and mama doing talking and I got out to pay the wagon. So when my granddaddy went off, I didn't go with him. He, he went on off, went back home, I reckon. And uh, I have never seen him since. I don't know how long he lived after that, or nothing about it. I have never seen him since. Well, how about your mother now? And her, her name was? My name, my mama's name was Ellen. Ellen, Ellen Jones. Ellen Jones. Yeah. Yeah. And she was from where, where? Was she here next to White's Crossing, wasn't she? Yeah, I was down, down in that community, so not too far from And that. who was her father and mother? Now, her, her father was named Hartford, Hartford Jones. Mm -hmm. And her mother name was Elizabeth Jones. Her mother was a sasser before she married my granddaddy. Now, now who was your granddaddy on, uh, on your... Your mama's yeah. side, uh, my granddaddy on mama's side was a sasser. His name was Calvin. Calvin Sasser. That was Grandma Elizabeth Jones's daddy. daddy. Yeah. Calvin Sasser. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've, I've seen him some three or four times. And uh, he had been to the, some kind of a war. And he had a big old bullet laid up on the shelf, on a mantel shelf, that he said it was taken from him. From him. Some words about his breast some or another he said i believe he said it he said if it uh, 
went a little closer than I might have killed him. But Which anyway, war was that? Civil uh, War. Yes, civil I reckon war. it was a Civil War. It must have been that. But he was there and he had a big old gun, an old musket, I like to call him. And, and he showed that to me. He had to stand in the corner of the house. And I believe, I believe he was, uh, before he died, the year he died, he farmed. And I think they said he tended about 10 acres of land. And I believe they said he was about 98 year old. When he died? When he died, yeah. Now, how, how about uh, Grandpa Hartford Jones? Who was his granddaddy? Uh, I, don't, I, mean, I, don't, his daddy? I don't remember him. Uh, his daddy, it seems like his daddy's name was Dob Jones. I don't know. I won't be too sure about that. But I never did meet him. I never did see him. Uh, all I knew about him was grandpa so his daddy I don't know nothing about him nor none of his people I met one of his brothers Jake I believe they called him but I didn't I didn't question him none I didn't talk with him but very little they said he was grandpa's brother that was all uh, something like a year or so after grandpa died that he come there but uh, that's about all I know about my granddaddy's people. And then, of course, then you you grew up, and then you married the first time. You married the uh... the first time I married a Clemens. Her name was Lily Clemens. And uh, how old were you, granddaddy, when you married Lily? Well, I believe <laughs> the best I could remember now was uh, about. 22. I see you were born when now, Daddy? I, I was born in 1894, February the 24th in 1894. And, and I was married uh, December, 20, December the 23rd, I believe. What, I believe it was December the 23rd. And I'd have been 23 or 23. Well, about 23 years old in February of the next year, but that was in December. I married my first wife. I lived with her approximately eight years. We had, she had three children, two boys and one girl. And what are their names, Granddad? One of them, the oldest boy was named Walter, and the next one was named James, James Henry. And uh, my daughter, she, her name was Charlotte Gray. Yeah, her name was picked out of a book. Her mother picked that out. I didn't have nothing to do with naming none of them, but one, the meanest one. That was my baby. And he was named after, he was named Fred. That always makes him for me. Of course, his name was Fred Coble. It's his real name, but he, he's pretty good right on. He's my baby right on. I claim him as that. Sometimes I love treating that, but he's got biggies in now, he don't. He want me to pet him too much, but he, he likes to be petted a little bit sometimes. Now he was the only, but, but he was the child of your second wife. Yeah, that wife. was my second child, my, my second wife, all the ones she had. And she lived with me until she was about, uh, I believe she was around 80 years old when she died. She was. I, I don't know. I believe and so. And what was her full name, Granddaddy? Janie Norris. Wasn't it Nancy? Nancy, Nancy yeah, Nancy Jane. Jane. Nancy <laughs> Jane Norris. Yeah. Nancy Jane Norris, yeah. And her mother? I married her in 35, in October of 1935. Do you remember the date? The date? October what? 1925. 1925. Yeah. yeah, 1925. Because I was born in 1927. Yeah, that's <laughs> right, that's right. You're right, you're right. He's a, he's a baby right on, but still he'll argue with me sometime. <laughs> but anyway, she lived with me. We raised him to see him a, a married man with four children, three little old girls, little old pretty girls. Of course, that one a little, but there was they take taking after him a little bit. A little bit hard skin, some of them. And then he was blessed with an old boy, and you know how they are. But the old boy, he's pretty good. So uh, we we all wound up pretty good together. We got along well. Lord blessed us, give us a plenty of 
of this world stuff for us to live on and not a fortune we with poor people right on but still the Lord take care of us and as so far to the day I'm about 88 so I, I don't know why I'll make it 89 or not I'm hoping so but I don't know about that and if I do it'll be, have to be next February it can't be no other time because that's when I was born Daddy do you remember uh, Mama's mother's name? Margaret. Margaret. Mar Margaret Noble Norris. She, she was a noble before Mr. Norris married her. And how about her, what, how about her daddy? Uh, I don't know her daddy. I never, I never have seen him. No, I'm talking about Mama's daddy. His name was what? Oh, your Mama's daddy's name was Francis Norris. Francis Marion Norris, wasn't it? Yeah, Francis Marion Norris, that's right. Old Swamp Fox. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Do you know who his daddy was? No, I don't. I don't know who his daddy was. I believe, the best I, I know of, I don't know whether they really had a, a marriage daddy, a legal daddy, and of course we know they had to have a daddy, but to, to him, I don't, I don't know. It seemed like to me they said that he was a child that didn't have a lawful daddy, you know. But was that so granddaddy or was that? That was, was, grand, that? That was granddaddy. Or was Miss, it Grandmama? Grandmama, she, her daddy was a noble. Yeah. So they got that crossed up. Some of them had got that crossed up full. But it wasn't right. Her her daddy was a noble, but he was a legal man. They were legally married. But I don't think her, Mr. Francis' mother was. I think he was born probably before she married. When did uh, your first wife, when did you say she died? She died in 1975, wasn't it? No, your first wife. My first yeah. wife died in 1924, 6th day of June, 1924. What, why did she die? Uh, well, she was uh, half gone, she was halfway with another child. And she went to a doctor, she was sick, she was, her. Uh, uh, Wara had, had, was giving her trouble and she went to this doctor and he gave her some medicine and she come home about 12 o'clock and uh, told me her head hurt and she went and lay down across the bed and I told her I said well stay there and I'll pick me and him or something to eat so we did we eat and she didn't eat said she didn't want nothing and she I got, got up and told her I'd be back directly and I went off about a mile to a man's house and uh, when I got there, about the time I got to the house, I hadn't sat down on the porch, she was sitting on the porch and I hadn't sat down and told her nothing about my business. When a boy ran up and told me my wife was a die, something was wrong. And uh, so this man, he got up and hooked up one of his mules to a buggy and went after the doctor. I told him to. I asked him would. He said he would. And I went on back home. And uh, she was, she wouldn't, she didn't talk. And I asked her, where did she hurt that? She said, all over, she reckoned. And pretty quick that doctor come and he gave her some medicine and so this fella went right back with, no, this fellow waited for him in town. And the doctor went back and gave him a subscription and he went to the drugstore and got some medicine. And he come back and told us how to give it. And uh, the director was on the ball or two. And so uh, some, I believe Miss Alice Williams was there and she gave her a dose of the medicine. And it wasn't very long before she had a spasm, a fit they call it. And so, well, this man, he went, called the doctor again, he come back there and stayed with her a while. And about 11 o'clock that night, she died. And uh, after her death, I talked with him about it. And he seemed to hate it mighty bad, but he said he really didn't, didn't know that she was in the shape she was in, but said her kidneys were gone, one of them. Was just eat up. And he said the medicine he gave her was for her kidney, and when it hit her kidney, it threw her in the ditch. And so she died about 11 o'clock that night. And there was no further in 
investigation over her death and nothing. We just put her away and that was it. All we know to do in them days. Did uh, you? There was not hospitals then? No, there? There, wasn't, there was a hospital in Wilmington. That was the closest one. Wilmington, North Carolina? Yeah, yeah, that was about. I expect about 60 miles from the way. From where you live, from where you did live, the old home place? Yeah. That was 70 miles. 70 miles, that yeah. was the... Where was the old home place? The old home place, it was, uh... You know, uh well, you're talking about where, where, you, where we live now. Yeah, right? where, yeah. Isn't old, that where she died? Yeah, yeah. That, right, that old house there where we, yeah, where, you know... That my old home there. And Vinegar the, Hill. Yeah. yeah. Right a mile of Vinegar Hill. That's 70 miles from Wilmington. That would have been uh, something like 15 miles or 16 miles from Whiteville. And about four miles or four and a half from the Tabor City, they call it now. The known then is Mount Tabor. So we lived about then, about a mile of Vinegar Hill, a little crossroad. Was it called Vinegar Hill then? Yeah, it was called Vinegar Hill then. Why was, was it, it called Vinegar Hill? Well, I can't tell you that. I don't, I, I don't know. I talked with an old man one time at Sawmill through there. At Sawmill there at Vinegar Hill for four, five, or six years. And I asked him that. And he said he didn't know. He said when they come there, he was working for a fellow Pridget. And he said when they left, that was, there was that another crossroad. There was an Iron Hill crossroad. And he said they moved there to a little place called Vinegar Hill. And there they stayed for I don't know how many years. They built an old tram road through there to haul lumber on a truck to the railroad. But later they moved to Tabor, Mount Tabor. And of course that ended that tale. I don't know. They never did move from there as I know of. Now, Teresa, that tram road that he's talking about, I, mm -hmm. I have played on that base back, back of the house in front of my house now. It's about, what, a half a mile through that. That yeah. used to be a, what they call, a little tram road where they, uh, the tracks was laid in there. Well, you know where Lee and Prince is at. Yeah. Well, it, the old tram road run back of his house down a piece of, through that. It went to the river. It wouldn't be over, it wouldn't be over um, a quarter of a mile from where Ken's Island is, B-Boy Island, I call it, right back down in the back, because I played on there many yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, it was there. I walked there a heap of time, drove cows up it. When we had, when the free range, when the cows went out in the woods, we'd go way up there, they'd go up at the curve of the railroad, there's a big savannah, and they'd go up there to feed, and they'd lay up there and stay if you didn't go back and come home. And we'd go up there and they'd come that old tram road back home. There's a path, they'd follow that path back home. The cows would? Yeah. yeah. Did y'all have pigs too? Well, the hog didn't go that far. A hog, he didn't range that far, you know. He ranged pretty close around the field. But the cows would. The cows, when the grass was tender and they could eat it good, they'd go to them savannas up there where it was really, really there was grass there then, too. And they'd go up there, you know, and they'd stay. They'd stay all night. Some of them get on the railroad, get killed, train would kill them. Yeah. Well, how did you how did you know your animals if you let them go free like that? You had marked in their ear. You marked them in the ear. You cut their ear. You put a mark in it. Some people had a one man had a, a mark that it was a, a square cut. You just cut the end of his ear off. Just a little end of the ear. It didn't make any difference what it was. You could cut the end of his ear off. If it's a hog, you cut it off. If it's a cow, you cut in her ear off a little bit. Not too far, you didn't have to cut too much. Just enough for people to see it. And then the, when you went, well, you, you knew your cows. Now in the summertime, anything but a milk cow, if you wanted to drive them home, you, you got yours started all you could, and if two or three more started with you, why well, you'd, you'd let them go too. But Mostly, they would find out they were wrong too, you know. They, were, they were, weren't dri driven by people much. And they'd break out this ranch of the bunch you had, and they'd go another way. So when you seen he wanting your mark, you'd look at his ears, you know, watch him till you could find his ears. And if he wasn't in your mark, why, well, you just let him go. He stayed up there right on. You just carried yours home. 
So if you got in a bunch, you got to put a good bunch, and he got in a, one of them got in a bunch and went right on to your home. While all you done, you just shut up yours and let him stay out. You didn't mess with him. And it, so naturally, he'd wander back to his flock and stay with him. Daddy, when you first started farming, what did you use, I mean, like to plow with? Did, did you use ox? No, I used a mule. I never yeah. did. I, I never did plow ox, but uh, we're, we're the, well, I have plowed them for other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I had an uncle got a plow ox for, and he was a good, pretty good plow too. He he pulled a plow. You, you plow, They play. Uh, they had oxen then and mules and horses. Yeah. When yeah. do you remember the first tractor you ever seen? Oh man, I don't know the first. I remember the first motorcycle I ever seen. I seen a. A mail carrier a ride near. His name was Craven Fowler. He carried a mail route one from Tabor City now. Now Mount Tabor was in. He was and, a motorcycle. Uh, yeah, and uh, well he still he started with a horse, but he got made a little money or something other, and he bought him a motorcycle. And uh, of course the day he went with his motorcycle you didn't take your mules out. <laughs> and your horses just stayed in because they were scared to death. Though. Well how about the first automobile? You remember seeing the first? Doc, Dr. Bassett had it. Same doctor that went to my wife. He had a big old thing and of course if you seen him coming you took your mule and your horse and you went in the woods <laughs> because there was no no chance to keep it back. He had a big old car and he run it a while and the first tractor, I, I, I don't hardly remember that hardly, the first tractor I've ever seen. It seems like to it about some fella, a fella Stevens, that had a lot of strawberries at Mount Tabor. I believe he had about 22 acres to say. And he hauled them with a two horse wagon and two mules to it and a big old straw rack. And the old straw rack was about two thirds as high, it was about four foot high. And he'd pile them up there on it and he'd catch quails. The quails got to eat them. And he set traps and catch quails and built a big old pen and shut the quails up in it and fed them till he got through picking bears. And then he went and opened the top of the pen and let them come out. Let them go back free. He wasn't killing. And I believe he got some kind of an old tractor to, to work them bears with some way. He had so many of them, so you worked them with mules. That's what he had with mules. But he got some kind of an old thing. But I don't believe he could do much with it. It didn't have no tires on it. It had iron wheels spikes, and like, spikes yeah. and gigs in it yeah. so if it had a root it would pull out yeah. and I, I I don't I don't think he done much with the old thing did it have the fenders on it yeah the wheels had the fenders over yeah I believe it did I believe it has was it something fenders. like this Fordson tractors well you seen these old was, Fordson tractors yeah it was kind of in that shape but the Fords well, it would have outnumbered it 25 to 1 but that old thing, I, I don't know. I, it seemed like I seen him once or twice. He did trying to work with it. But I don't think it gave it a, to give him satisfaction. He couldn't do nothing with it. And I think he tried to cut down on strawberries and made out with his mules right on. Do you want to stop and rest a while now? We'll stop for just a few minutes. Well, we'll study up something of that. <laughs> Granddaddy, where were you born at? I was born at about, uh, I don't know, about six or eight miles from Whiteville, Whiteville, North Carolina. I believe the name of the highway now is uh, 504, I believe, 405 or something like that. Anyway, what direction was, from Whiteville is? Uh, well, let's, now let me see right now. now. What direction from Harbor? That would be about this way. What would this way be from Harbor now? What would this house be from? What direction would this house be? Is it? Is it east? No, it sets east and west. It would be north and south. Okay. I probably. So it's I'm, about six miles. 
south of Whiteville. South of Whiteville. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And were you born in a hospital? At, at, they didn't have hospitals no, then, did they? No, I not? wasn't born in a hospital. I was born in a log house, I imagine. But uh, we wouldn't, I wasn't born in a hospital, I know that. I never, I never knew what, I, I never been in a hospital till I had an uncle got burnt. And he was sent to a uh, hospital in Wilmington, James Walker, they called it. And I went there to see him. That was the first hospital I'd ever been in. I went there to see him. No, in our day, we didn't have no hospital. And my sister, oldest sister, she was born in Burnley County. And I was born in Columbus, and she was born in Burnley. But we was raised and spent our days mostly in Columbus County, except uh, after I was married the first time, I went to Wilmington. And I lived in Wilmington about eight years. I have two of my children were born there, my two first boys. Walter was born there in 1918. And James was born in 1920. And we stayed there uh, about eight years. And we moved to where we was at when she passed away, which was... In Vinegar Hill. At Vinegar Hill, yeah. And that's where my daddy, Fred McCombie, was born. Uh, yeah, Fred McCombie was born at my old home, at the home I had there, where he was born in a hospital. We had a doctor with him, by the name of Dr. Williams. And uh, he was born and raised there, and went to school there, and was Made his, made his school in there, and he was called in the Army. He served in the Army for, I don't know, probably two years. And he lived there with us ever since, and lived with us as long as we kept house there. Why wasn't he in the service but two years? He was, uh, he, he wasn't called. He was called and left, stayed there about two years. About, Approximately two years. It might have been a little over. I would, I wouldn't say exactly how long. Didn't he get but, hurt? Uh huh. Didn't he get yeah, hurt in the service? Yeah, he got hurt. Uh, he he didn't do like I wanted him to. I didn't want him to go. But uh, his two two half brothers were there, and of course they, they didn't have no difference in half and whole. There was brothers together, and I, I tried to raise them that way. And uh, they was both in service. Of one of them, my oldest one, was in the Navy. And uh, the next oldest one, he was in the Army. And uh, he spent three years and something in there. So my baby, Fred, you call him, he wanted to go. And so one morning, some fellow had to go. Some, some boy had stayed there with me, worked for me some. He had to go. And to Chad would see about going off. They had sent for him to appear up there. They had the draft. And, yeah, so he went. And uh, when he went, Fred went with him. And so Fred, he got to talking to the lady up there about it. And uh, so she asked him, said, well, do you want to go? And he told her yes. And so they fixed him right up and he went off with that same boy. And about, I believe it was about five or six days, he went off with that boy. And he was gone practically about two years, something, something around two years. But Fred didn't see no combat. He was in while there was, while combat was going on, but he didn't see none. He didn't get over there in time, but he, he went overseas and spent a, probably a year, a little over a year. And spent, he spent about two years and stayed in overseas together. And that was during World War II. That was during World War II, yeah. And I was called in World War I, but I was turned down on account of a weak heart. But I'm still, it's still kicking right on. It must not have been very weak. Did the doctor say you had a weak heart then? Dr. Slocum, a uh, heart doctor for the government. But I was working with a firm that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, things can happen that people would love to keep a man. And somehow or another, I don't know how it was, but that mother they like me. I was there as long as the wheels rolled. You work for Acme? I, I work for a textile company. And uh, 
they were they were good to me because they had a right to. I worked every day they said work. If it's Saturday, it's all right. If it's Sunday, it's all right. If it was a holiday, it didn't matter to me if they said let's go, I went. And uh, in textiles, what did you do? Textile, I was a beamer. I was the next highest man to the boss man. A beamer? What's yeah, a beamer? A beamer, he makes a warp for the weaver to weave the cloth out of. And that's a job that's cut out for a man, too, because I'll tell you, it's, a, it's one of his a meaner jobs as I ever had in my life, and still I love to do it, and I wore a good name with it. But Where was this company at, Granddad? This company was in Wilmington, New Hanover County. How many years did you work for them? About, about seven years. Almost the whole time you lived in Wilmington. Yeah, yeah, I didn't have no other job at all. When I went to that place, when I went there, I went to work there. Was that the first job that you ever worked for anybody no, else? No, no, the first job I ever worked, worked for the lumber company. In the log wood, skidding logs, working in, uh, getting up logs. How old were you when you took on your first job? Well, I was about 13 years old. I was a little boy. I had to go to work because uh, in them days a woman couldn't get nothing to do hardly. And if mama could get a little bit of work to do, she didn't get but 40 or 50 cents a day is all she got. And so I got a job that was a fellow Coleman, was a boss man, and I don't know where he was sorry for me or not. But anyway, I asked him for a job one day, and he gave me a job of riding a mule through the swamp, taking the rope, a big skiller rope, out through the woods through the swamp. And I think they pulled it about uh, 225 yards. And uh, this mule did hook us, hooked that hook in the swing of tree. And I'd get on her back and that old mule would go there. And after she went one time and the log come in, well then she knowed where to go better than I know where to care. And she'd go if there wasn't no water there or no bad place. But if it was a bad place, she wouldn't go. She'd go around it and I couldn't help myself. So I told the boss man about it, I couldn't help it. And he said, no, neither can I. He said, just stay on her back and let her go <laughs> someplace and I'll get her in there. Was your boss, his name was Coleman? His Coleman, last name? yeah. His Do you remember was, what his first name was? Yeah, Rack Coleman. Rack Coleman. Yeah, that was his first name. And uh, I worked there for, I don't, I don't know how long I did work there, probably uh, a year or two. How much did you make? Did they pay you a day? A dollar a day. A dollar a day. What I made. I made you mean you made a dollar a day? Yeah. And you were only 13 years old? And, yeah, and I, your mother would work and she couldn't make but about like 45 well, cents a day? 50, 40 and 50 is what she got. They paid? Yeah, they paid. Now, when I worked with her, they paid me a quarter, 25 cents. Yeah. And But to give mama 40 and 50, some of them would give her 40 cents. And some of them would give a 50 cent. Some, there's a few, one or two around there that was, maybe I don't know, they might have felt sorry for us or something, you know. But they'd give them almost 50 cents if she worked. What did she do? Oh, uh, done any kind of hoe work you want done on a farm. From hoeing tobacco, not, well, we didn't have much tobacco, just a little bit. But hoeing cotton, that was the main money crop in them days when I was coming out. Cotton and sweet potatoes and corn and peas or anything they wanted done with a weed and hoe, why that's what she done. And some of them would give her 50 cent. One man was a, appeared to be a pretty good man to us. He'd give her, he'd give her 50 cent a day when she worked. And she couldn't get much to do when was early in the spring. People, their grass was bad then and the weed. Did. So she could get pretty well all the work she could do in the spring of the year until they come up about midsummer probably July and August, and that was kind of cut out till they got to go in strawberry. Then about strawberry time, after we picked strawberry, wound up properly, the last of May, the first of June, then they had them berries cleaned out. They had them wet out and worked out and keep the grass out of them. So that gave her a right smart work to do. She'd be hard, you know, she'd do a right smart work. Some of them wouldn't pay all the money. They'd pay her enough chicken for eggs or grease, lard, or homemade lard where they'd kill the hog and dried it up. They'd sell her that and sell her a little piece of meat once in a while. She didn't get any money worth nothing. Of course, 
She got a little bit of money. They did give her a little bit of money, some of them. Some of them better and some of them was what. That, uh, but she'd always get, get a little bit of money. And if I worked, they gave me a quarter. And if you like hoed, if you worked uh, on the farm, yeah, I'd, I'd they'd give you a, a quarter a day. Yeah, they'd let me plow. Some of, some of them would let me plow a little bit. And I love to plow because there's a mule in it to pull it. And I love the mule. I always love to stop. And I, I love to plow. If a man tell me he'd plow, I'd plow for him. I reckon for nothing if he just let me plow his mule. <laughs> and there's one man had a big old black mule. And that old mule's name was Jack. And boy, I did love to plow that old mule. He didn't walk fast. But he had big old feet and a big old mule, too. I couldn't get the back band up on him fast to trace it. But man, I love to plow that old mule. And I'd plow him. And that, man, and that old man, well, he was good to me, too. He'd give me 25 cents every day. And he'd give you the money if his wife would let him. Sometimes she wouldn't do it. She, she was kind of stingy. But he, he was. He, he paid me. Was this and before you were 13 years old now? I was, you did? well, fact, I was about 12 or 13, 12. From, yeah, I say you know, from 10 to 12 years old. Yeah. 10, 10 to 13, something like that. But we get, we got along. My granddaddy Hart, June, he would give my mama a load of corn every year. He'd have corn. That's all he ever had was corn and a few sweet potatoes. I know it. But he'd give her a load of corn and put it on a wagon and carry it home. And that's we shook that corn and shell it. And we'd take it to the mill. They had mills in to ground the corn. And we'd take it, and there was a lot of mills around there. And we'd take it to the mills and they'd, they'd grind it. They'd take two quarts of it out of a half a bushel. And they'd take four quarts out of it for a whole bushel. If you carry a bushel, they take four quarts out of it. They carry a half a bushel, they took two. That was but, like their pay for grinding it. Yeah, that was their pay. But we didn't care a bushel. We could, I couldn't tote it. Mama, she'd. She'd twist it up. She'd put a half a bushel in a sack, and she'd twist it up. So I put it on my shoulder, had to get it on my shoulder, and I'd towed it to the mill, two or three miles, and the man would grind it for me. I remember one time, you gonna tell her. I remember one time, it was cold, and we was without something to eat, some meal. We didn't, we didn't have no flour and rice, hardly ever had any of that. Once in a while, Mama would buy 12 pounds of flour. They would, then you had to buy it, they'd dip it out of a barrel. So we didn't have none. And, and we, was, we was without a cornbread. And so Mama, she got up that morning way before day and shucked and shelled a half a bushel. And just about the time it come day about it, she had me on the road with it. And I went to a no man's mill, a little water mill, ground by water. We'd pull up a gate and the water would run through there and turn the wheel. So while I, he had to sum up for grinding when I got there. And uh, while there, I set mine down and I went down and got to look at the water where it was running through the gate set, where he had the, the mill running. And the fish was coming up there. And it was a red thin pike. And that pike, he'd come up there and they'd try to go up a little hole in that gate. That was a hole in that water back. There's a, it wasn't holding it all back. There's a little bit pulling through. And he'd try to go up there and he couldn't get up there hardly. He'd, he'd fall back. And this old man had a, a little old dip net on a long pole. And he'd come down there to me to see what I was doing. He, he come down there to see what I was doing, I reckon, and I was just sitting there, down there looking at the fish, the pike, so. And he said to me, he said, uh, uh, give me that net there. And I, I got up and handed it to him, and he reached down there and dipped up a great old big pike. And he told me, he said, get your string. And I jumped out there and broke me a bush, and I got a string. And he sat there and he dipped up some, so he laid it down and he went in the house to see about the mill, the corn was grinding. So he come back and he dipped up some more. And when he quit, he had to go and pull mine up then. Well, he didn't go back no more. 
So when we quit, we had 13 pikes on the string. They're pretty pike too. So the, the man, when he poured mine up though, I watched him and he took up a little cup that held about two quarts and he dipped it down in my corn in my half bush of corn, he dipped that thing down and got it full, way full, it was just full of coal. And he held it up for just to, look like he just for uh, breath, and he turned the cup bottom up and then poured it every bit back in there and threw the cup over there where, he, where it was blown. He didn't take that bit of my corn. So he got my corn ground though, and he fixed my sack, he tied it just like Mama tied it, and he divided that meal, and he twisted it so it would be stayed there good, and he took it up by both ends and laid it on my shoulder. He said, now, is, does it fit all right? Are you all right now? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, so now you can go home. And I got out of the little old mill house, and I started, and I just got a little way, just a few steps, and he looked and called to me. He said, ain't you gonna get your fish? I said, uh, uh, would you go and get, get, give them to me? I, <clears throat> he said, yeah. Yeah, he said, that's what I called them for. So you take them and carry them home. And it was cold that morning. Boy, it was cold. But I took them fish, and you told my little fellow to go with it. <laughs> I trod what I could, and I walked as fast as I could. And I got home. Mama, she took them fish, and she cleaned them. And she didn't do, do a thing in the world but take their insides out and their gills out. She cooked their heads and all. And she baked a big old spot of cornbread and you talking about a supper, a late dinner, but we had one who wouldn't stop. The president never had down no better than that Well, who that was time. the man that did that, granddaddy? Mr. Ed Spivey. Mr. Ed Spivey. Yeah, Ed Spivey was the man. And I've always thought that probably that he wouldn't take toll from Mama's corn because she, he knew she was a widow woman and nobody to have a work but this one little boy. And so I think that was his reason not to take it. Maybe his conscience led him that way. Yeah. Well, Granddaddy, what other jobs did you work? After you were 13, you said you worked for about a year, but then where? what did you do after that? Well, I worked uh, when I was, uh, I worked in different jobs, odd jobs, and when I was, uh, before I got married the first time, uh -huh. I was uh, still back with the lumber company. And I stayed with them till I got married, and after I got married, I stayed with them, uh, I don't know, not not a year hardly. And uh, we went to Wilmington. And I stayed there the remainder of my time till I moved to Vinegar Hill. And then when you moved to Vinegar Hill, uh, was it after that when your your um, first wife died? Yeah, after or I moved. Or did she die in Wilmington? No, she died at Vinegar Hill. Okay. Yeah. And then when you moved to Vinegar Hill, what did you do there? Well, I was born from then on. I did you born. buy some land yourself? Well, yeah. First little piece of land I was born, about 12 acres. How much did you pay for those 12 acres? Uh, I believe it all was about $600. $600 yeah, for 12 acres? I believe, I believe it was about $600 for all of it. And then uh, a few, well, a year after that, I bought five acres, and I gave $150 for it. Because the boy run me down one day, he wanted to sell it to me. He said it was right at me, and it was right at me. My, my baby boy is living on there today. On, it's got his home on the piece of land. And uh, I gave him a hundred, he charged me a hundred and fifty dollars. So I paid him a hundred and fifty dollars. So that was my starting in the farm. And then I kept gaining a little bit, a little bit along till I kept buying a little bit more till I wound up with about 40 acres, I believe. So now he's wound up with about 50 acres. He had about 10 more to it. And you farmed the rest of your life then, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Up until how many years ago was it when uh, you... I believe it was about three years ago. Well, there was two years before that I was in and out. My health <laughs> began to fail and I was in and out. My daughter, she was living in Wilmington. And I was in and out with her and at home. And I got to the place I, 
I had to have some help somewhere or another. And uh, so they, they left Wilberton and moved down here in the country. And uh, I moved with them. The day they moved, I moved, and I've been here ever since. That's in Mali. Yeah. You're living right now right in, in Mali. the city of Mali, North Carolina. <laughs> that's really Clarington, isn't it? Yeah. In Clarington. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when you I'm farmed, there. I remember growing up, Granddaddy, that uh, you had strawberries. Yeah, I, I remember. Had, yeah, I had strawberries right in front of strawberries. Well, I reckon you, you might remember the day I spanked two out of the cornfield full of fodder, too, don't you? No, tell me about well, that. I did. How old was I when oh, that happened? Oh, you were a little old thing about the side of a big duck. <laughs> uh, a couple of years old, a little older, you know, and you and your little brother got out there one day, and you had seen me the year before, I think, pull a little bit. So you got out and pulled it when I didn't want it pulled. What, was that so about, I, like, three or four? Yeah, and I warned you about it, and... So you quit that day, but a day or two after that, I caught you again. And buddy, when I picked you up and used my hand about twice on you and stood you down, you went to that house, <laughs> I'll tear it out. And Mike, I got him, but he kind of got away pretty good, but I caught you first. That was and, my older brother. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that ended the party pulling. You didn't pull any more party. So that ended the beating. I never did have to spank you more. Well, you used to have an old dog named Butch, didn't you? Yeah, we had old Butch. We loved old Butch. He was a good old dog, too. We kept him for years and years. Well, when you had strawberries, Granddaddy, what did you pay people to well, pick strawberries? Well, I, I started with a penny, one cent a quart. One cent a quart. Yeah, and I wound up five cent a quart. That was how I ever The paid. people who would pick them. What about packing? Who packed them for you? Did Grandmama? Well, Grandma packed some of them, but gradually I grew into them. I got to be a kind of a big fella, you know, and I had the hard packers. I hard up. I think I had about three or four regular packers for the last I had. And so I paid them, I believe it was about $4 a day. They worked till sometime 12 o'clock, sometime 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. And I They'd get start in. early in the morning. What yeah. time did you start picking? Uh, just as quick as one got there. I didn't care. Just so it lied down from the sea. He got there. I had a couple of girls lived about three miles from me. And they was mostly the first that got there. They got there always pretty much between Dave, Eric, and Tunrod. And they would pick till 12 o'clock. Had to go home to reset the back of that evening. And that's right. They averaged about five dollars a piece. They picked about a hundred quarts a piece. That was my, that was my two top pickers. Of course, I had others. I had a, others that would go right along with them, but uh, that was my real two top pickers. We picked, sometimes it, we picked so many crates. Sometimes we picked 25 or 50, and one day we picked 112 and 100 and long like that. Well, when you sold the strawberries, how much did you get out of them? The last three years I worked strawberries, I got, I got a guarantee of five dollars a crate for 24 quarts. And the last year it was 24 pints. After I was guaranteed, I got that every day. Every day, I, my bears went off, that's what I got. Man paid me, most of the time man paid me before he left. A lot of times he didn't, you know, he would come, I would, there would be different pickings, you know, different crates. So many crates today, so many tomorrow. And, Sometimes he wouldn't have enough money, but he always brought it next morning. I sold him one man, a man in uh, Charleston. So I quit him. I got to the place I couldn't get no help. All the help got scarce. People got off and all. You couldn't get no help. So I quit strawberries. And when I quit strawberries, I knew I quit farming. I had them. I quit it anyway. I'd give it over to some baby boy, he was running, he was looking after most of it. And I had my garden and my strawberries. So me and my wife, he one, wasn't able to, we were out of help, began to fail. So we just not talking. She gradually, I gradually lost her. And so then when I lost her, I lost it all. So I was one stalk to the hill then. And I went to stay with my daughter in Wilmington. And I stayed with her off and on for two or three years. And uh, I'd still want to come home, and I'd come home, and 
a lot of time not to come home. I, when she get, when they start back off, I wanted to go with them, but they were out of sight, out of, out of speaking distance, and I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't try to stop them, but I decided when she moved down here that I'd move with them. So the day they come, I believe they brought a load of her things and furniture from Wilmington, and it went right on and brought a load of mine back. So we got together and we've been together ever since. She's pretty good too. She grumbles a little bit sometimes, but she don't grumble much. I, I can make out. Of course, being a husband, both triple, we can't we can't have one do nothing. Dead with arthritis. Joe, he can't. He got a husband. He can't walk on on his crutches. His old legs just just give out. And mine pretty well that way. But with the help of the Lord, I can get around, Joe. You're talking that, about Uncle Joe Spivey. Yeah, I'm, that's your uncle, Joe Spivey. Yeah, yeah, he's the gentleman I'm talking about. Of course, he's pretty good. You know, he's about as good as ever. Direct. Got a little old great grandson here. I call him Spike. His name is really, his name is Chris, but uh, I nicknamed him, had to call him Spike, because he's pretty smart. He, he worked in the back of this year, and he made more money than I've ever made a day in my life. He made $20 a day, but he wouldn't spend it on me. He was stingy with me. I think he got the most of it put away. He, he hit me a few tough something once in a while for a dollar, but he ain't too bad. He, let him, lend him a dollar, he, he'll promise to pay it back. If he don't pay it back, he'll wait a good long time before he lasts you for another one. But if he pays it back pretty quick, he'll be right back to borrow another one. So I'd rather he wait a while. Okay. He, got, he ain't with us now. He's, he went back home to go to school. He's got to go to school. He worked hard enough money to make it, buy all his school clothes and made a payment on some kind of a little old cart thing and he... <laughs> Little road car or something or other. So he turned it over and night to roll on him and he rolled for hundred or somewhere or another and beat him up a little, not much. But he I think he made enough he extended daddy out of a hundred dollars, I think, to pay on it to it. And I don't know what he paid the rest of it or how. But anyway, he's going to school, he's going to school in Wilmington now. And uh he said uh that's the way he goes, he wanted him to come back. As quick as he was out of school, he had a job for him wanting him to do. So I think he's going to come back just as quick as he's out of school. He's coming back and going to work again. What's his so, full name? His full name is... What? Say we, your for, full name for us. Mercy Weeps. Your full name is Mercy? What is your first name? Tell her your full name. Christopher full. James Spivey. Okay. Christopher James Spivey. Okay. Well, Granddaddy, I remember you having a smokehouse behind your old home. Remember you, what? I remember you had a smokehouse. You used to a keep your house? meat yeah. in oh, there, sure didn't I you? A, sure, I had a smokehouse. Yeah. Uh, you raised your own you know, meat? I, you know, I raised my own meat up here. Yeah, I raised my own meat in Greece for years and years. We, I never bought a bag of meal or a bag of a pound of meat and a pound of grease, I don't know whenever. When did you first start buying stuff like that? Oh, when I first started keeping house. When I when I first started keeping house, I bought me a, a first time I had first one I had I had one pig. I bought me a pig. And uh that old pig got we kept him to well he weighed two fifty or three hundred pounds, something like that. Anyway he lasted me so way over in the summer before I bought him. So after I was married and I dressed him in December, I went and bought me two more. And then I kept two for a few years. Then I went to raise them on my own. When you got your farm? Yeah, when, when, I, got, when lady, I got a little bit of room and, and on farming, you had to have room for hogs, you know. To, so I, I got cleared up a little bit, added a little bit of land to it. And so I got to raise them on hogs. I have my own hog, my own milk cow. You got your own milk? And, well, yeah, we had, we raised your daddy on milk and butter, about it. And we had a nice milk cow. We kept, I kept a nice milk cow. I kept a nice milk cow and a nice mule or two mules, whatever I had. If I had one mule, it was pretty. If I had two, she was pretty. I fed good. I kept good harness on. 
and I worked them hard, but they was able to stand it because I kept a plenty for them to eat. They didn't go hungry, they didn't go without water, and they didn't go with gear on them that hurt them in no way in the world. I tended to it. So we, we got by fine. The Lord was good to us. He blessed me. I've been so much short of the things I should have done, things I ought not to have done probably, but he still blessed me to wind up with pretty good home and fair health. I don't know how long it'll last, how long I'll be here, but whatever time it is, I hope I'll be ready when he calls me. So that's about all I have to say about it, I know of now. Well, Granddaddy, I'm glad we could take this, and we're going to stop taping now.